Hello and welcome. My name is Ben Brownlee for Boris Effect. And in this particle illusion tutorial, we're going to be looking at how we create a fast motion background out of the thousands of presets that come with particle illusion. We're going to be auditioning and finding the ones that we want to start with, finding out a theme, tying everything together, and most importantly, seeing how we can move these in time and space so that it all fits together for the project that we're working on. So, without further ado, Let's have a look. The first thing we're going to do in the Particle Illusion interface now is to try and find a suitable theme for what we're going to accomplish. And I'm going to do this again by coming into my browse layout. And as the idea is to create this uh, retro background, then I'm just going to type in retro in here just to see if there's anything that we kind of like. Um, and this isn't really the right style that I'm after. So instead of looking for retro, I'm going to look for space instead. And we've got lots of transporter style of effects. Here we go, really cool. But we've also got these vector asteroid things, which I really, really like. So this is probably going to be our start off point. So if I come back into the default mode, and it's brought us down to where we can see we've got the different vector bangs, you can also see that we have tags in our emitters. And these are the things that make our emitters searchable. So this is something to remember when you're creating your own emitter is to ensure that you actually put down lots of tags to be able to find it again later. If I come into preferences, we can change how we do the search. So I can just search in the folder names. I can also be searching in these tags, turn that on and off. And I can also turn off displaying the tags in the emitter library. So we hit apply there and open up my emitter library again you can see that those tags have disappeared. I'll come back into preferences and turn those on because personally, I happen to like having the, the tags on because if I find something that I like, I can use this to help me find a theme. So if we go space simple. That's going to cut down our search areas even more, our search options even more. So I like a lot of these. I'm going to uh, add some favorites to these ones as I'm going through nice when you're finding like a little theme to just add some favorites in there and see which ones we are going to use or not kind of like vector bang five I like vector bang as well so now if i get rid of these and just have a look and just go into our grid view and just display our favorites then we can see the ones that i have chosen and have a look at these and think, actually, I don't really want vector bang anymore. I can just turn off the favorites and that will get rid of it straight away. I'm going to add in the uh, arcade missile trail as well. Because I really like this one. We're definitely going to use this one. And I'm just going to add all of these elements onto the stage. So I'm going to add the uh, asteroids in and the missile and the vector bang. If we've got time, we'll come back and do the uh, the missile as well. Okay, so let's uh, play this back. See what we've got. It's a bit of a bit of a mess right now. So let's work with each of these individually and see what we can do. So I'm just going to disable the ones that I'm not interested in right now, and we're going to just start working on our vector asteroid field with stars, because this is going to be the one that's most instrumental in setting the scene. Uh, and I actually quite like this one straight out of the box. I mean, it's it's doing what it needs to do. It's kind of uh, already rotating around, giving us a nice bit of movement. I really like this one. And the only thing I really want to change is probably the um, the color. So I'm going to go for a classic green. Let's find the nice bright green there. And I'm changing the tint color in the properties. And already the tint strength is set to you know, set to uh, 90, so we don't have to go too far. The originals are, are white, so, you know, we can sort of mix that back into a color that we quite like. I'm very happy with that. And I'm going to leave my um, asteroids just as they are. Now, the one thing that I can do, if, if I don't want to have my asteroids looking exactly like a preset or like everyone else's preset, there's one simple thing that I can do to change it. And that's to come into the random seed. And this random seed controls all the randomness in the elements that we have. So if I just change this up a little bit, 
You can see the position and movements of our asteroid field or asteroids changes as that goes up. Now, there's never any right or wrong answer for what that random seed should be. The starting point for all of the variation and all of the other random numbers that we have within this emitter starts off at this number here or starts off with this random seed here. So all you have to do is just change it until you find something you like. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is come to the vector bang, I think. There we go. Let's turn this one on. And this is exploding just in the middle. So let's turn this up here. So let's come to a frame where we can see pretty much everything. I'm going to do the same sort of things we did previously. I'm going to open up the properties, change my tint color. There we go. So make this one a little bit brighter than previous. So I'm going to keep some of the white in there. So keep my tint strength down about 45. That should do. And I'm going to zoom this up so that we have something nice and big. And I'm going to position this in the bottom corner. So just click and position that out there. Looking nice. Hang on, let's. I might actually want to increase the size even more. So we'll increase the zoom even more. There we go. So we get a really good idea of it exploding. Now I'm going to need a little bit more space for my viewer here to show you something. So I'm just going to come into my edit layout. There we go. So if I zoom in, you can see we have aliasing on some of our particles. If we're using sprites that are either uh, a bit small or we've zoomed everything up, as we have in this case, um, quite far, then you might see aliasing on some of the particles. So if I come into the particle that holds these boxes, which is the small, open this one up and come into properties. I have this parameter called MIP mapping, which you, know, you probably haven't seen for quite a long time. It was the last time it was explained was when John was going over the controls. And if I turn this on, you can see that there's some anti-aliasing happening on my edges. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So MIP mapping off, MIP mapping on. So this can really help to smooth out some of the lines if you've zoomed up just a little bit. And I'm going to leave this off for two reasons. The first reason is simple. Uh, at a zoom of you know over a thousand, the only thing that's actually really going to make any difference with getting some nice, smooth, sharp edges is coming in with a higher resolution sprite. And the other reason is I think the aliasing actually fits in quite well with this project and looks pretty good, suits the style. So those are the reasons I'm going to keep MIP mapping turned off. But if you've got particles where you can just start to see some uh, aliasing on the edges and you don't want that, then MIP mapping is the place to come to try to help soften those out. Okay, let's just close that up. I think we we embrace that. Might take the zoom down maybe to about 700 now. Let's have a little look. I'll do the same things I've done a couple of times before, just change my play range to 150. Of course, if I knew that I wanted a specific range, I could set that up in the project settings, but we're playing it a little bit by ear at the moment. And that's looking pretty good. Now, if I didn't want this exploding right at the very start, there is a way to sort of prevent that. If I come up to my vector bang emitter, have that selected, you can see my start frame down in the graph, just underneath the timeline. And if I drag this over, I can choose whereabouts we start that animation. So now it's going to be frame 60 before we see that explosion. Just come back and fit my viewer up to 100% again. So we can move elements in space and time. Maybe the subject matter seeming relevant a bit now? I don't know. Um, let's come into the arcade missile trail here and enable this one. And I'm just going to keyframe this through the frame. So I want this to start probably about a second or so in, maybe, maybe at frame 32. Bring that in there. And I'm going to start this out of the frame over here. And I'm going to turn on my animation mode. So now if I touch any of these parameters, we're going to automatically keyframe that property. 
as you can see over here. And how long do I want it to go? Probably finish it around about there. Let's just move that over in that direction. Let's play that back. And that's that's looking all right. I think we could probably start a little bit sooner. And look what happens to my keyframes. There and there as I drag this backwards. You can see the keyframes drag with it. And this is really, really useful. If we didn't want to change the timings of these keyframes, all we have to do is hold down control or command and then click and drag and that would leave my keyframes where they were. But I don't want that. What I do want to do is make sure that I turn off my auto animate. There we go. And obviously I think this needs to be a little bit green as well. So if I try to turn this just green, and go with the tint strength, you can see it sort of blows out quite, quite easily. And that's because we're getting really quite bright here. So if this starts to happen to you, all you have to do is back off on the value down a little bit there, and then that won't blow out quite as much. If I want to be really mission critical on these colors there, we go inside the shapes themselves and we would come in and change the colors in there rather than use the tint. But I'm quite happy just to do this fairly quickly. One last thing that I want to do with the, uh, with the arcade missile here is I'm gonna to come to my second keyframe and I'm gonna change this to Bezier. And when I do that, I can change the path directly within the viewer or within the stage, I should say. This doesn't change the keyframes. This just changes how my path moves from left to right. So it's just following that nice curve there. And I'm, I'm quite happy with how this is looking, I think. The only thing that I might want to change is just how the explosion is happening on my spaceship here. Because I want to show you a different way of animating stuff over time. So if we go to the vector bang, which is the one we were looking at, and I'm, I'm going to go to my uh, lines. Those are the important ones. So that's, hang on a sec, if I show you what these are, disable and enable. So it's these main bits here. What I want to do with this is to have the explosion go really fast and then just kind of almost stop dead. So something that really wouldn't happen in space because obviously in space, an object is just gonna keep moving until something else acts upon it. But, you know, we're not going for realism here. Don't know whether you'd noticed. So we've got a couple of things that we can change with the speed. So we have velocity and this is already keyframed. So this is keyframed from 99 to zero. So this means that particles that are born here are gonna be moving out quite fast and particles that are born here aren't gonna be moving at all. They're gonna have zero velocity. Well, almost zero velocity because we do have some velocity variation. So we're gonna have a bit of random velocity on those particles that are born here. So this velocity is affecting particles as they're born which isn't what we want to change. If I wanted to slow these down from around about here, well, obviously we can't use velocity because if we could, you know, velocity is at zero now anyway, so that would be stopping those in their tracks, but that's not how it works. These affect new particles, not the old ones. What we do have though, is a velocity over life. And if I click on this, we get a different sort of curve. And this curve goes from zero to one. Zero being when the particle is born, one being when the particle dies. And the duration of its lifespan is controlled by life and life variation, to give that a little bit of variation there. So I can be scrubbing in the timeline quite happily, seeing how things are looking. And I could also be scrubbing down here in the graph. And now as I scrub down here in the graph, because I'm in my over life parameters, Nothing's updating up in the viewer. Let's take a look at this graph and, and, and see what it's doing. 
So it's starting at 200. So what this means is that when it's born, the velocity is going to be twice what this velocity with the variation is uh, actually going to say it is. So if my velocity was five, because we're at 200 here, it's actually going to be 10. And then it goes down to about 100, about you know 17% of the way through its life. And then as we get older and older, it slows down until it reaches zero or no velocity as it dies. So we can change this graph so we get a really big boost of velocity at the very start of its life. And then it falls down or slows down really quickly. It's like almost hitting the brakes about 25 or actually say 30% of the way through its life. So this can be quite nice to give a bit more of an explosive effect. It was a little bit too much, but the cool thing is we can always come in here. Boom, there we go. And change up the graph as it's playing back. And I think with that, I'm actually ready to render this out now. And here we are back in Premiere with our graphic put in place with a little bit of text on top as well. Now we've been using the standalone version of Particle Illusion. If we're working in the plugin version, which uh, I've got just here, come into my effect controls, I can make any sort of last minute changes that I want to. If I needed to change up timing, add a bit of different animation, or maybe just add in some last minute elements right at the very end. I can do all of that without doing any re-rendering. I can also add a glow right onto my image. There we go, something like there. And as Particle Illusion is part of the full Continuum package, I can use other Continuum filters such as Continuum Damage TV and Continuum Bulge to create my final effect. So in this exercise, we've looked at how we can use tags to find themed emitters within our library, add them to favorites while we audition them, and add multiple emitters to the same project. We've tweaked and arranged these elements in space and time so they fit together, and also seen the difference between a particle's velocity and its velocity over life. I hope you found this useful, and we still have a lot of features to go through in Particle Illusion, which we'll be looking at in coming tutorials including fun with forces and deflectors and creating our own custom torrential rain effect. But for now, my name is Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects and I'll see you again soon. Download Particle Illusion standalone for free at boriseffects.com, including thousands of free emitter presets. Continue watching this Getting Started tutorial series to learn more about what you can do with Particle Illusion and find out more about the plugin version of Particle Illusion with extra features, including built-in Mocha motion tracking, at BorisFX.com.